Hello and welcome to The Hidden Lives of Writers. My name's Fiona Snickers and I'm joined by my co-host Gail Schimmel. Hi Gail, how has your writing week been? Fiona, I am at a strange point of writing. It's it's a better point than, than sometimes, but I'm coming towards 50,000 words in the mm-hmm. book that I'm working on. And it's a lovely point because you can see the downhill. Right. But I'm feeling strange about this book. I'm not sure if it's actually ever going to see the light of day. And I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to get from 50,000 to 80,000. So it's been a bit of a sticky week in that way, trying to figure out how do I go forward with this because I'm in a genre I haven't done before and and I'm not as confident as I usually am on how to bring the denouement to the page. So it's been a challenging week in that way. How about yours? Well, I was just thinking the other day, I don't know if I've ever spoken on here about my use of the Pomodoro method. I'm not sure. I don't know if we've spoken off air or on air about it. I don't think you have. Okay. It is something that a lot of writers use, Mm. but it's worked so well for me that I thought Mm. it was worth mentioning. I've talked about getting up early in the morning and getting my writing for the day done, but I haven't talked about how... I set a timer on my phone to do it. So depending on which manuscripts I'm working on, and I do very often work on more than one manuscript simultaneously because it it kind of, I think, helps me settle down, just knowing that if I have a new idea, I am free to work on it. I can add it to the list of things that I'm currently working on, and that calms my mind and lets me focus. So I usually try to write... 300 words on a manuscript per day. Okay. And I give myself half an hour to do it, which probably sounds like a lot of time to you, but um, I can do 300 words in half an hour. I think most of us can. And I set a timer and I set about getting those 300 words written. And I normally come in just under the buzzer. And I find that if you're adding 300 words a day to a manuscript, by the end of a year, you have a full manuscript, and that's working five days a week. That's not even including weekends. And I think the lovely thing about 300 words is it it is realistic. You yep. can do 300 words in a day without feeling overwhelmed and unhappy. And then do you do the Pomodoro method? And because from what I understand it about, did I say it right? Is that what it's called? Yes, or yes. did I name a pasta? Um, <laughs> you work for half an hour and then you break for five minutes and then you work for half an hour and then you break five minutes. Do you come back and work for half an hour again or do you just do one round of it? Well, what I've been doing, I'm working on two manuscripts at the moment. So I'll set usually a 25-minute timer, get 300 words written, get up, walk around, make myself a cup of tea or coffee for five minutes, come back and add 300 words to that same manuscript. So it actually ends up being 600 words a day because I am chasing a bit of a deadline with this. Then after those 25 minutes, get up, make myself yet another cup of tea and then add 300 words to my second manuscript, which is growing at a slower pace. Fiona, I feel like this warrants a whole me interviewing you podcast and I'm going to put that on our list of to-dos that I think if I ask you all the questions I want to, we're not going to get to a guest today. What are you consuming this week? I wanted to talk about something that I've been watching. It's a show called Barry uh, with the actor Bill Hader and it is extremely odd and I would also say not Brilliant. I'm not completely in love with it, but it's very, very interesting because it is crossing genres, which is something I'm interested in. It's this chap who is an assassin and he's also interested in improv as an actor. Okay. So he is desperate to get out of the assassin business and get into the improv business with this little amateur troupe that I he's mean, working it's an, with. It's an obvious <laughs> career move, really. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just a short skip, hop and a jump to improv. Um, but unfortunately, the, I don't know, Russian mafia or something won't let him go. So in between having to kill people, he also has to go to auditions. And of course, it is funny. It is fun. It's got that kind of manic, what can I say, lock, stock and two how many ever many shooting barrels, that kind of of manic, crazy 
dark energy, which is fun to watch. And it, it's just an experiment in genre. It's done rather well, I believe. And it's it's fun to look at and to think about the possibilities behind story. And what have you been consuming? I mean, I'm going to say a lot less fun from the sounds of it. But, you know, I very, I very seldom challenge myself in reading books that are very literary and very beautiful because it is a different kind of reading energy. You've got to read slower. You've got to read more carefully. But mm. I am a huge Isabel Allende fan. Mm-hmm. And I have just started her book, Violetta. And I, I have found some of the books in between House of Spirits, which is her, her first book that I think a lot of us read when we were younger. And for me, it was really just the most beautiful reading experience. And then I've loved some of her books and some I found harder. Mm-hmm. And in recent years, I found her harder. But I don't know if you say Violetta, 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 I imagine, is I feel like it's a return to that House of Spirits voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm really loving it. I am finding it slightly harder to read. I'm more likely to be distracted into social media or whatever other rubbish I can find on my phone. But when I get to the reading, I'm really enjoying it. So it's been a good reading week. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to asking our guest today what his reading week has been like. I have a feeling it's going to be quite literary. (laughs) Our guest today is Sipiwo Mahala. Sipiwo is the author of the novel When a Man Cries, which came out in 2007. Also the short story collection African Delights from 2011. Another short story collection, Red Apple Dreams in 2019. Uh, He has also published his PhD thesis in the form of a nonfiction book, Can Temba, The Making and Breaking of the Intellectual Tsotsi in 2022, and also two stage plays, both of which I was privileged to see, The House of Truth and Bloke and His American Bantu, um, which was doing the circuit in 2022 and I believe still has life today. Hi, Sipiwo. Thank you so much for your time and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. (laughs) <laughs> so, Piwa, we're going to throw you right into the deep end. How has your writing week been? Well, <laughs> has your writing week been? Not very productive, I must say. Um, I, I entered the week with uh, two outstanding <laughs> essays. I, I think academia is taking over my, my, my writing time. So last week I was supposed to have submitted two essays. And that's what I've been working on, and uh, it's coming along very well. At least I'll meet uh, the deadline today. I'm mm-hmm. supposed to be submitting one. <laughs> I think before I ask the question, I really want to ask about how being an academic works with being a fiction writer, etc. Give us your backstory. How did you come to writing? What made you want to be a writer? But what do you do for your day job, and how did you get to that? Well, I think I'm first and foremost uh, a lover of literature. I grew up reading a lot of uh, stories, particularly in Stosa. And um, I think by standard four, I wrote what my friend reminded me was probably my first uh, a product of uh, creative imagination, which was uh, uh, sketches, picture stories. Mm-hmm. You know, because I used to read a lot of those from Bona Magazine. And so I had that interest in both um, reading and also trying to be productive at the same time. So when I finished my trick, I went to university. It was natural for me to study literature. So I studied literature. I majored in Afghan, in what was then called African thought and literature. And um, I started publishing officially in 2001 when I published uh, two short stories. And I was still in my hometown, uh, Makanda, then mm-hmm. Grahamstown. I, I got so excited that I, I resigned from my job. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I resigned from my job. And uh, in 2002, I, I enrolled for master's at, at VETS. And as part of my master's, I did creative writing. And that's when I wrote what became a story that essentially de- defines my, my literary career. I, I wrote um, uh, The Suit Continued, which is the reimagination of Ken Temba's classic, The Suit. Mm-hmm. And that sort of um, 
created a bond between myself and Ken Temba because so many people as we've written comparing my work with, with that of Ken Temba. And I, I felt the obligation to understand Ken Temba more. Uh, but unfortunately there was nothing much on him. Um, no, no, no real definitive study on Ken Temba and certainly not, no biography. So over the years, I, I did research and ultimately registered for a PhD, um, in which I focused on Ken Temba and I graduated in 2018. And then my thesis won an, an award from the, um, National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, to convert it to, to, to a, a book. So yeah, I converted into a book and then, um, I, I wrote it as part of my fellowship at the, at the, at the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study, um, a research institute of the University of Stroberg. So I, I did my thesis while working full time for government. I work for, I worked for 18 years in government, mm-hmm. you know, and then, um, so last year, 2021, I decided to take up academia full time. And I think it's one of the best decisions I've ever taken. So I'm, I'm, I'm a full-time lecturer, uh, in the English department at, at, uh, at UJ. And I still continue with my fellowship with, with, uh, trials. I love that story. I love that, the image of this excited young man quitting his job <laughs> on the publication of two short stories. I really love that. I saw myself as a writer, you know. <laughs> and when I look back, I, I, I got a copy of that journal, um, uh, quite recently and it's a very clumsy looking uh journal it's, it's just a, a piece of paper stitched together you know a spiral binding mm-hmm. but it, it it was just too exciting for me i saw myself as a writer already it's magnificent yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so going back to your novel when a man cries which came out in 2007 mm. um it's very interesting to revisit, especially in light of um, notions of toxic masculinity today. That idea of can a man cry or is it a disgrace for a man to cry? That's something you explore with your character. Has that changed at all? Do you see any progress between when you wrote that novel and now have ideas of masculinity changed? Well, I think as, as men, we, we're dealing with, uh, very complex, uh, uh, you know, situations, um, psychologically, socially, you know, culturally, you know, whatever way you want to look at it. And, and most of these challenges remain. I, I think as a boy who, who, comes after after three girls like I'm, I'm the last born at home and mm-hmm. the only boy and i i grew up very conscious of what distinguishes myself and my sisters mm-hmm. i mean it, it was society made a point to emphasize that you know that, that that's that's how we grew up and and one of the you know key things was to say um uh, boys don't cry men don't cry and I began to question this, um, in, in 1996, um, when seeing, um, uh, the late, uh, emeritus, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, mm-hmm. uh, crying mm-hmm. in the first hearings of the, of the TRC, mm-hmm. you know, I, I began to, to ask myself questions, um, does, uh, uh, crying in full glare of TV cameras make, uh, Archbishop Tutu less of a man? You know, or so more. Ex- ex- well, <laughs> 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 I think exploring that 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 idea, um, you know, uh, gave me that impression that maybe he is more of a man uh, because I, 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 I finish the book uh, with some lines. Um, I wouldn't remember uh, quite accurately, but it says something like, uh, mine are not the tears of sadness. Uh, wait a minute. But it goes on to say, they are the, the, the expression of, uh, of the infinite longing for complete humanness. Mm-hmm. To be a man among men, to cry when hurt, that's what makes a man without tears. He is incomplete. Something along those lines, I, I wouldn't remember. But, um, 
essentially what it says is that um you 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 depriving yourself of your humanity if you're trying to hang on to the idea that you shouldn't cry just because you're a man uh beneath it all are human beings and human beings have to express their emotions i'm going to ask a very personal question now has writing it enabled you to cry easily have you have you been able to shrug off the teachings of childhood and cry when you need to cry I'm not sure if it's it was writing it or it's just getting old. <laughs> <laughs> we all cry the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the the older I get, the the, the easier I find it to cry. Um, uh, just over a week ago, I was at the National Arts Festival and uh, I was watching a comedy, and and I found myself crying because. I, I just had an idea of, of a play that I should be writing, you know. So, <laughs> so I, I found myself while watching a comedy. So, but yeah, in, 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 in earnestness, I, uh, I, I cry a lot more. Um, I, I, I feel liberated to, to express my emotions, uh, a, a lot more. Yep. That character of yours in When a Man Cries, Timber. Mm. I know he's not based on your real life because I know that you, Sapiwo, is basically the exact opposite of that guy. Um, but where did you draw your inspiration for him from? Well, I, there's no particular person, mm -hmm. uh, but I draw, um, uh, you know, inspiration from, from different experiences that I encounter, uh, you know, uh, uh, along the way. Um, uh, the same applies to, to all other characters. You take this element, you take this element, and, and, uh, really, um, what I was trying to explore there, are, are, are you know, different challenges that men in particular face, mm -hmm. and, and how, uh, when we try to resist our humanity, when we try to, to take responsibility, you know, uh, on the basis that one is a man and has to show some strength, uh, one way or another, we end up really um, hurting others mm -hmm, in the process. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to, I said I would come back to it, so I'm coming back to it quickly before I forget, because like you said, getting older, I cry and I forget things. <laughs> um, and I want to come back to this idea of balancing academia and writing and creativity. And how does it fit together? For me, studying literature is very different from creating creating full stop um for you is it different is it part of the same thing and how do you balance that well it's both part of the same thing and 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 two different uh, things at the same time um in the sense that i my first interest in literature was reading and through reading, I started to imagine my own stories, whether, you know, it was first, uh, you know, in the form of images, like um, when I started to express myself creatively, it was through drawings and all of that, you know. Um, so, yeah, there is that correlation. Um, uh, but what I've, I've found really difficult is to write on both genres at the same time, mm. uh, it proved really, really difficult. Especially when I was um, I was in government. You know, I I, I did my, my my PhD while while working full time for the Department of Arts and Culture, mm. and I I got to a point that a bureaucracy on the one hand and academia on the other were just uh, too toxic co a combination. You know, so I, I needed an outlet. So I wrote a play in the middle of that, you okay. know, and so in, in a sense, they complement each other. You know, when I felt overwhelmed by, by these two, which I was doing full time and serious things. They, yeah. Very and then I, I, I decided, you know, to, to do something creative. And then I wrote my first professional play, uh, The House of Truth. Um, but now that I'm, um, I'm, I'm a full-time academic, um, uh, I must say, uh, my creative output is suffering a little bit, um, simply because I, I'm prioritizing one over the other, like, uh, for, because for all these years, I've been writing more creatively. Uh, 
And now, I mean, academia and in academia, you need to produce peer-reviewed work um, if you want to progress. Mm -hmm. So that has been taking more of my time, uh, but it, it doesn't mean I, I you know, I, I don't write creatively. Uh, as I say, I, I had an idea of a play while watching another and I'm, I'm pursuing that as well. Um, I noticed that you haven't revisited the novel format since When a Man Cries. Is that something you might do in the future? Is there a reason why you moved away from that format? Well, uh, it's definitely something uh, I might do in the future, mm -hmm. uh, probably when I retire, <laughs> which is not too far in future. <laughs> um, I... You know, I allow myself to 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 explore uh, in writing, regardless of the the genre. Um, when I started writing, I started with short stories, and for a long time, I believed that short stories was my cho was chosen medium. And then suddenly, I was seized with uh, with this passion for plays, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I'm giving that a chance. Um, I was working on my second novel when I you know, decided to pursue academia in, in 2014. Mm -hmm. So I had to abandon that right. and, and then focus on academia. And then the moment I, I, I finished, that there's always new challenges. So, yeah, I allow myself to go with the flow, uh, so to speak, as long as I'm still creative. Um, if... I were to compare, for instance, uh, in all the genres I write in and to say which one uh, is closest to my heart, um, at this stage, I still cannot, uh, uh, you know, say exactly which one. Um, as, as I said, you know, initially, I thought short stories were, were the thing for me. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, there were not so many uh, publishers that were keen to publish short mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. In fact... Uh, when a man cries was a series of short stories. Oh, interesting! I yeah, didn't know that. it it was first written as a series of sh short stories. Um, probably only one of them previously published. Um, but what I did is that I realized that there was um, a thread that connected them: mm -hmm. um, the the exploration of uh, manhood and masculinity. So, and at the time. You know, publishers were very reluctant to publish short stories. Mm. So I decided to rewrite them and uh, interconnect them and, and try to create, you know, a plot that runs through. And that's how When a Man Cries happened. Uh, but over the years, as I say, um, I've written plays and I find them more gratifying in the sense that you know, you write one play, uh, like my latest play, Block and His American Bantu, I wrote it in less than two weeks. Wow. <laughs> um, and yeah, it has a life of its own. Um, to actually sit in the audience mm. and observe the reaction, to me, that, that that is the most gratifying experience. I remember when I, I watched um, uh, The House of Truth for the first time, uh, at the National Arts Festival. Mm, I was in that audience. I remember saying hi to you. <laughs> oh, really? I can't even remember that. I was too nervous. <laughs> so I, I had not seen the play. Uh, in fact, the play hadn't had a full run. You know, that's how difficult it was to put it together. And, you know, sitting in the audience, hearing people giggling, mm -hmm. laughing, and then sobbing and mm. crying, you know, for me, the, 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 you know, it, it was essentially getting authentic feedback without people mm. knowing that they were doing so. Mm. So th that's why I, I find, I find plays more gratifying. And, um, you know, as, as it travels around, you get to see different reactions from, from, from the audiences. You're making me want to write a play. It sounds <laughs> like an amazing experience. It, it is. It is. Uh, plus, uh, there's more money in there. But don't say I told you. <laughs> very, very interesting <laughs> note to solve. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, um, you know, 
in in a role as an academic, you you are a teacher, you are a marker, you are a critic, and then as a creative person, you open yourself up to the criticism and the marking and the the people thinking they could have done it better to you. How how hard is that for you? That that coming from being the one to tell people how to do things to being the one who has to listen to the criticism. Well, I I think the advantage for me is that I opened up I opened myself up for, for criticism first of all mm. uh, I started writing and having you know my work criticized mm. so um uh, so I, I'm used to that uh, when I write anything that I write I know I'm putting it out there and it's it's no longer mine um any kind of reaction that uh, that comes from the audiences is, is exactly how they feel, is exactly how they relate to it, you know. So I'm, I've accepted that a long time ago. Um, but now having to criticize, well, I think also writing criticism is, uh, is something that, uh, I've, I've gotten used to because mm-hmm. I've always had views about, uh, certain works. Um, but now having, I think the main challenge for me, uh, and even as much as I, I enjoy teaching so much, uh, the real challenge is marking. Mm. You never know what to expect. And it's not maths. It's not like there's a wrong <laughs> answer and a right exactly, answer. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I learn a lot from what they write. I learn a lot about how People will receive what you say and how different generations uh, interact with text. So it's it's been a learning curve for me, and and I, I really enjoy you know seeing different perspectives. And it so happened that when I joined UJ, um, uh, one of the colleagues was actually teaching uh, um, a series of stories. That included my work. Um, you'd recall that uh, when I responded to Ken Temba's The Suit, Zugu Savannah uh, did yes. the same yes, in yes, the yes. Makosa and Akaba. Mm-hmm. You know, so you have that intergenerational dialogue. Different writers, you know, um, are responding to 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 each other, and I um, I was given that course to teach. <laughs> oh my goodness! With your own work, with my own work, so <laughs> it, it, it was the most awkward thing. <laughs> and, and now we are going to study a very important piece of writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know what to expect. I, I was worried that you know most students would probably try to say all the nice things because uh, the lecturer happens to be to be one of the authors, mm. uh, but. Uh, it, it was, it was really impressive that they, they felt liberated. They, they, they interacted with the text, uh, at least most of them, uh, without taking regard of who wrote it. And, and they really came with new perspectives to my own work, uh, perspectives that I, I never really thought of. So th- that was quite exciting for me. And did it excite them that you were the teacher, that they were getting a unique opportunity? It, I think it allowed them to dream. Um, after almost every, actually since I, I joined UJ, uh, in, in almost every class, there'll be a student that remains behind. Uh, because they want to inquire about publishing, mm. you know, mm. uh, because I think to them it, it, it's become real that, uh, books are written by human beings like you and me. And therefore, uh, you know, that they can make it happen, uh, too someday. So, yeah. That's beautiful. When we interviewed Nick Mklongo, he credited you with revitalizing the short story genre in South Africa. He said that until you came along with African Delights, nobody was really doing it and that he followed your lead in putting together a collection of short stories and approaching a publisher with it. Was it your kind of sentimental attachment to the drum generation that inspired you 
or have short stories always been your medium of choice? I, I think short stories have, have, um, always been um uh, uh convenient and 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 uh appealing to me um simply because i i i come from the tradition of oral narratives mm-hmm. um i think in red apple dreams i i do talk about how my grandmother would uh uh you know, sit and, and create a story out of just about anything. Uh, in, in the book, I talk about how she created a pillow, you know, um, that she would take an old sack and stuff it with, uh, old clothes, mm-hmm. um, and then stitch it. But after, after a while, when the, when the sack, when the pillow is, is soiled and needs to be washed again, you cannot wash it with all those pieces inside of it. Mm-hmm. So she has to unstitch it and take out the items that she has stuffed in, 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 in the, in, in that sack. So as she takes out each item, she would tell a story about it. I make an example, for instance, where she says, um, this, this, uh, piece of cloth is from my blouse that, um, I, I wore when I was a young girl and that's how your grandfather noticed me amongst all other girls. And then what began basically with, with the idea of just washing a pillow becomes a story about the family tree, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I come from, from that uh, culture of spontaneous sh- storytelling. Mm-hmm. And essentially, if you le- check the duration of, of, of that kind of story, it, it amounts to a short story. And also the, the elements that you find in a short story, um, are, are the same elements you find in, uh, in, 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 in a longer piece like a novel. You know, I've, I've written a, a paper about that. You know, how a short story for me is the foundation, uh, for, for modern storytelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We talk, we've talked a bit in, um, in the previous season of this podcast about coming to the page with a sense of duty, a sense of the, the weight of your culture and your history and your people's history on your shoulders. Is that something that that is real for you? Do you feel you have a duty as a storyteller or you just a storyteller and you tell whatever story you feel like telling? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't feel I, 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 I carry any responsibility or, or any duty. Um, it, it's something that, that is in me. Uh, it's, it is part of who I am. As, as I say, I mean, it, it has evolved over the years, of course. I, you know, I, I started with, I was exposed to the culture of, of storytelling. And the good thing about storytelling is that it teaches you to listen, uh, to imitate. You, you start telling the same stories and obviously reimagine some of the aspects of it to your peers and all of that, you know. And, um, even before I could write, I, I learned to listen, to, to imagine in that sense. And, and I, I learned to interact with images, drawing, trying to make sense of the, of the images in magazines and all of that. So for me, that is the evolution of, of the storytelling tradition, you know, until such time that I was able to read and, 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 and write my own stories. I told, for instance, about, um, about, uh, the, uh, the picture stories that I, I wrote, uh, when I was, I, I, I mean, I, I wrote them uh, when I was in standard four. Um, at the same time, during that period, I, I, I remember what I could consider as, as probably my very first piece of fiction written. Um, it, it was in a form of a letter. I, um, we, we were in a school tour to, to, Fort B Fort, which is about 90 Ks from Makanda, mm-hmm. and which felt very long at the time and obviously very exciting to students. It, it was my very first uh, school tour. And we got there, it was all fun. And then coming back, most of my peers had had addresses from girls, uh, oh. but I wasn't brave enough to get one, you know, but no, not to be left out. Uh, when they started receiving letters, 
I decided to write a letter to myself, pretending to be a girl I met in uh, in <laughs> Fort Beaufort. I love it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah, I mean, looking back, I think that that was my very first piece of creative writing. I've got to yeah. ask before I let Fiona carry on. Do you still draw? Honestly, not much. And my wife was reminding me that um, when the lockdown began, we I used to draw a lot with my with my daughter. Mm. Um, I actually posted some on, on social media, some of those, and that gave her, um, you know, a, a, a good basis in terms of uh, her connection with uh, reading and writing and even drawing. And yeah, since then, um, since uh, 2001, probably I, I haven't, uh, drawn much. Uh, and even before 2001, I hadn't been drawing for, for a number of years. I'm very tempted to make you do a drawing for us. You know, I'm not <laughs> going to, but I'm just putting it out there that I'm very tempted. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that, uh, that I enjoy when I get to do it. I'm not doing it only because uh, of time pressures. Yep. Um, I might be wrong about this, but now African Delights was published by Jakarna correct? Yeah, that's correct. And Red Apple Dreams, did you publish it yourself? Yes, I did. Um, did you fundraise for that? What was that journey like? And would you do it again? Yeah, absolutely. I'll do it again. Um, I, I started exploring with uh, with self-publishing, uh, what I prefer to call independent publishing. Um, I'm saying independent in the sense that I'm independent of uh, the uh the you know the major publishers mm. uh, i i do it uh through my own company um it's not self in the sense that i'm not the only one mm -hmm. uh involved in the publishing of it uh in other words i follow all the protocols all the uh different steps that are followed by by mainstream publishers mm -hmm. uh in terms of quality control so formal edit, formal layout, absolutely cover art, everything, everything. You know, so it's not publishing in that sense. It's it's what I call independent publishing. So I experimented with um, with the House of Truth, the play, and then later I went all out with uh, with uh, Red Apple Dreams. And uh, for the first time uh, as a writer, I, I felt like I was earning my worth. Uh, in the sense that with the normal publishing, the, the, the pie is cut four ways. Mm. Um, there's the publisher, there's the distributor, there's the bookseller, and then there's, there's myself, mm. uh, as the author. Uh, and he usually, usually gets the skinniest. Yeah. Size of the pie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, <laughs> the, the smallest piece of, of, of the, of the pie, uh, you know, is, is what the, the author gets. So now I, I was getting everything and, and I did so well uh, during the lockdown, especially, um, in three weeks, uh, in, in 2020, I was able to earn more than the amount of royalties I, I had earned from 2007 combined up until 2020. Wow. Wow. You know, that's that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. yeah. That really is yeah. an interesting yeah. statistic. You know, so, um, but what it means is that you, you have to invest, uh, yeah. you, you need a capital to, to hire readers, to hire editor, to hire, uh, graphic designers and all. Mm -hmm. So it's something you cannot do without uh, investing a bit of money. You know, I think so, that's such an important thing to get through to people that I think people think that independent publishing or self-publishing you can do it all yourself yep. and then they wonder why they're not successful yep. and they wonder why people aren't buying their books and it's because nobody can do it themselves I think it's that's so important yeah that's interesting because that's part of the paper that I'm, I'm writing now <laughs> <laughs> you see I'm actually an academic at heart <laughs> yeah absolutely you know um, because there are certain books you you look at it you can tell that this is self publishing. You can tell. You know. And, and it gives self publishing a bad name. Absolutely. Where absolutely. where is it when it's done properly like both of you do? It's magnificent. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to ask yeah. about titles. Sorry, mm -hmm. Fiona. No, um you've got beautiful titles. Is titles 
something that comes to you before? I particularly like Red Apple Dreams. It's, there's something so evocative about that. Um, it, does it come to you before you start writing? Does it come to you at the end? Do other people help you with the titles? What's your title process? Sure. Um, I think it's, it's both. Um, with my first novel, I was clear from the start that this is when a man cries. And then, um, with Red Apple Dreams, for instance, I played with a number of titles. Uh, I was trying to figure out, you know, whether it has to speak to the entire collection itself, whether it has to speak to what I would consider as the headliner in the, uh, in the collection, or whether I would speak to my heart. And I think I settled for the latter, you know, because, um, it was, Relatable Dreams, the story itself, uh, is, um, is, is inspired by my very last interaction with my mother. And it's a story that I, I wrote on the 30th anniversary of her passing. And it was the first time that I, I, I spoke about my mother in public. And that last memory had to do with her giving me an apple. And, and yeah, it was the, the one of the last moments that I, I had with my mother who passed away in 1986. I've got mm. shivers. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about how, well, I'm, I'm tying it back to what Nick said, which was when he puts a short story collection together, he has written those stories for other purposes, for journals, for translation, for people who've commissioned the story. And then when he's got enough, he puts them together and they, they aren't necessarily always thematically linked. But your short story collections seem to me to have strong thematic links with each other. Um, do you write them with a view to I am now building a short story collection or are they also all written for different purposes and when you've got enough you put them together? Yeah, well, um, first of all, I, I write all the time. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when an idea for a story comes, I, I scribble something and then leave it there. Um, sometimes I'll pursue it to, to, to the end. Um, so what happens with me is that, um, I was clear that I wanted to write a short story collection someday. And when I managed to publish my first novel, uh, at least I, I, you know, I had a breakthrough. Now my name was known in, in the literary circles. Mm. And in fact, publishers were approaching me, asking me if I've written anything new. No, so I thought here's an opportunity to to pitch a short story collection, mm -hmm. and at the time, Nick is correct. Most publishers had disclaimers on their websites mm -hmm. that uh, they don't take short stories. Yes, uh, including Jakarna that ended up publishing the my short story collection. So I I started to look at the stories that I had at that time, and 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 try to see you know, what is common amongst them. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I divided them uh, thematically and say, you know, for this, the, the very last section, African Delights, was supposed to be a novel that I was working on. Oh. I said, okay, let me break this into three stories. Mm -hmm. And and uh, similarly, I already had uh, uh, the suit stories mm -hmm. and Zuki Savannah had, had, uh, responded to me. And, yes. and I thought that dialogue uh, would be quite uh, interesting to readers. So yeah, I, I put them together that way. Uh, when I decided, in other words, to, to, to publish a short story collection, then I just packaged them, uh, you know, in terms of their thematic focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to ask you because as you write, as you're speaking, I'm writing cryptic notes to myself. Um, and you've just talked about you go and you write down the idea. How much do you write that you come back to it and you understand what you were saying? Because I've got a real fear uh, uh, that I'm not going to know what I've just written down. <laughs> do you write quite a bit or do you just have a really good memory? I, you know, when, when an idea strikes me, I, I write even three lines, mm -hmm. um, leave it. And you and come back to it and it makes sense. I, I come back to it and it makes sense. You're um, very lucky. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> I have, you know, I would have an idea that haunts me over and over yes. again. 
um, a story like that is is Bonzo's Toll, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's 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 a story that stayed with me uh, for a very long time. So I think the the idea what w- were simmering in, mm-hmm. in in my mind, and then when I set to write it, I wrote from beginning to end without taking a break. Oh, really? You know, so th- there are stories like that. Um, that I sit down and write beginning to end. There are stories where I would write a few paragraphs, leave it, and then come back to it. So yeah, it's 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 always a, a different experience. But uh, key to it all is that when the idea comes, I, I jot it down. And for you, when you reread those stories, can you feel a difference in the ones that you just vomited out and the ones that took a long time, or does it read the same afterwards? I think every story strikes differently. Um, as I say, there are stories that I I write from beginning to end. There are stories that I go back to from time to time. Um, I I think I try to to diversify my writing. Um, I, I try to. There the are stories that are, you know, emotionally. Uh, very, um, captivating. There are stories that would have a lot of humor in them. And, you know, the process of writing and also revisiting them is, is, is always different. Um, sometimes you'd feel that, um, the humor is, is a bit too much. You know, um, that, never, that, never. That, humor that, can't be too much. <laughs> that, that the message <laughs> might, might be lost in translation. Um, there are stories that I, I would write, you know, as, 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 as some form of catharsis. Um, and not necessarily intending to publish, like, um, uh, Red Apple Dreams. I had no intentions of publishing it. Um, I just shared it with my, with my editor, uh, who was looking at my other stories, and she says, "I want this story in the collection." So it, it it took a while for me to get used to it. I mean, to to read it all over again and talk about the experience, and ultimately being willing to to have it as part of a collection. And well, surprisingly, it became the the title, the title story. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to ask about converting your PhD into a book for um, a popular audience. What was that process like? Was it a lot of work or was the the PhD thesis already almost publishable in that form? It was a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of work. I When I wrote the, the thesis, I already had an idea of a book in mind, mm-hmm. you know, and I... I thought I would just copy and paste and, uh, you know, get rid of, uh, one, two, three and then, and, and have a book. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I had a bit of a dilemma, uh, about, uh, whether, you know, I retain a bit of the, uh, academic dragon or I, you know, try to use my creative storytelling voice so I, I was really confused about that and I I wrote I think uh, now in retrospect uh, almost like I was rewriting the, the thesis mm-hmm. and I remember what I did was to I think I was lucky to to work with uh, Helen Moffat yeah uh, with whom I started working uh, when I wrote African Delights in 2011. So when she she got the, the 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 manuscript, she was like, "Yeah, fascinating story, but I can't hear your voice." Right. You know. So I had to go back and rewrite now freely because she said, "You've written the thesis. Now you have nothing to prove. Just tell us the story." And I felt liberated that way. I, I rewrote the whole thing. And I mean, from the, from the first chapter, um, the, the approach is quite different. It's, uh, it's, it's 
conversational, you know, you, you get the, the dramatic element of, uh, you know, of short story writing, you can say. Um, so yeah, I, I had to, I had to rewrite it, uh, that way to make it, uh, um, more palatable to, 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 to general audiences, not necessarily academic audience. And which process is more satisfying for you, the, the academic or the, the conversational? The conversational. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, well, academic writing basically, uh, most of the time you, you know, people try to write not to be understood, <laughs> 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 to sound sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> to sound as clever as possible. Yeah, yeah. You know, whereas I, I come from the background of writing, you know, to to be understood, to want to to captivate the audiences. You want you want people to read you, to understand, to relate to what you are, to, you are reading. Whereas in academia, you're writing to prove that I know more than you. You mm, know. Mm, mm, <laughs> mm. Am I allowed another question, Fiona? Okay, one more girl. One more question, <laughs> one more. I want to ask you about language. I'm making a presumption here that English is not your mother tongue, not the language you spoke first as a child, but you write in English. I'm right, you, you, you write in both. Am I right? You write yes, in Kosa as well. Yes. How do you make that choice? Talk to us about that. Well, first of all, I first wrote in English. Um, I've been creative writing in, uh, in 2001, uh, when I had to, Enroll at Rhodes for creative writing because before that I was, I was writing some stuff in Isitosa. I, I studied Tosa literature as well, by the way, you know. I think stories, for instance, I, the stories that I got to know, uh, uh, known about, uh, first, uh, were, were the suit stories. And naturally it's, uh, it's a fair town. Uh, English was the dominant language, you know, so it was natural that I would write in English. But as, as time goes on, I, I write less and less in, in, in Is it closer? Uh, maybe, uh, pr- primarily because I, I interact with English audiences. Uh, but, you know, when I write plays, which are dramatized on stage, I always, actually, if, even trust stories, I always add the element of, of his closer because, you know, the characters have to express themselves in that particular way. And I, I translated, uh, or rather rewrote when a man cries my first novel into his mm-hmm. closer, uh, in 2010. And part of the reason for that is when I first, wrote published uh when a man cries i was the pride of my community you know everyone was excited about you know seeing me on tv doing interviews on radio and all of that um one of the neighbors uh who was friends with my parents was so proud that she bought uh the book uh, but this is making me, is making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully this will make you laugh uh, mm-hmm. but she couldn't read english so she gave to her children to read for her. And then she started telling every neighbor what the story is all about. And then when people wanted to uh, borrow the book, she started charging them 20 rand. <laughs> <laughs> so she became an entrepreneur in the process. <laughs> um, now, I have never written a stage play, but I'm, I'm interested in the process. When you've written a stage play and you see it being acted in front of you. Does it feel like as much your work as a short story or a novel, or does it feel like more of a collaboration? Because there's a director, there's a producer, they're the actors bringing their own meaning to the words. Does it feel more collaborative? I think everything is collaborative in the sense that uh, even when I write a short story, you know, the response of the audience that I get, you know, the, the after of the after reader. So, um, with the play, I, I sort of detach. I think it was, uh, Vika Swarup, uh, the author of Slam Dog Millionaire, who said to me the other day that, uh, writing. Uh, said to me the other day, let me just drop a very famous name into the conversation and refer to our chat the other day. <laughs> he, he was posted here in South Africa. Yeah, wasn't yeah. He? when Slam Dog Millionaire, oh, you know, right. came out, he, he was a, a, a an ambassador, an Indian ambassador, ambassador here in South yes, Africa. So I remember that. I had interactions with him at, at that time. Um, so 
ask him about the adaptation of his book because it was published as Q&A. Mm. Uh, he says it's like allowing your child to marry. Okay. On the one hand, you 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 might have reservations, mm-hmm. but these are the reservations you cannot talk about because you don't talk badly about your in-laws. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you get proud when the when the child gives birth, uh, gives you grandchildren, and all of that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, it's for me it's it, it's quite exciting to 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 see um, people breathing life into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, beyond just the the words. Okay, well, that's so interesting. Um, we now want to ask you the question that we ask all our guests, which is, what have you been reading or watching or listening to lately that's made an impression on you? Well, I- I've just finished rereading uh, Ralph Ellison's uh, Invisible Man mm-hmm. because I- I'm, I'm going to be teaching it in the in the next semester, and I've sort of taken interest in diasporic uh, literatures, um, mm-hmm. knowing that I've, I've just written about Bloke and, and Langston Hughes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it follows on that. But right now, I'm reading this. I watched this play called Congolose Commanding Commissars. It's a play by Bob Chabalala. I watched it at the National Arts Festival. Mm-hmm. It is quite an, <laughs> a fascinating um, political satire Yeah, uh, that I would watch all over again. And I have this fascination now of watching plays and then trying to read the script to understand, you know, the evolution that happened from, from page to stage. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm looking forward to watching it at the, at the, um, market theater in, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Well, for our listeners who can't see you, um, I know that you're always documenting the process of your facial hair on social media. <laughs> and uh, I have to say that I thought it was Santa Claus walking in. Um, it, it was Thank unrecognizable. You. The beard's coming on so well. I must <laughs> congratulate you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've been working on this for quite some time. It's yes. a long project. <laughs> I'm so confused because I don't know the background and I've got to tell the listener that he seems to be completely clean shaven. <laughs> you must look. You must, you must, I'm you, going you to. must bring the writer's mind, I'm the writer's going. imagination to bear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go on a deep dive into Sapiro's facial hair now. <laughs> Sapiro, thank you so much for your time. It has been absolutely fascinating and a great pleasure to have you. We look forward to more of your work in the future. Thank you. I think I enjoyed this. Well, Gail, I think that is the first time that talking to a writer has actually given you an active idea that you might pursue. I think it is. It's not an idea for a story. It's an idea for what I need to do next. And I've been really confused about what genre I'm writing in, how to take the next step. I've been almost frightened of the end of the book that I'm writing Mm -hmm. because I don't know what to do next. And now I'm not, I'm not going to curse it by even saying it, but I think I know how I have to take myself forward as a writer. Okay. Well, that's, that's so inspiring. I hope that Sipiwa's interview manages to do that for someone else. I hope so too. It's a lovely <laughs> feeling. Gail, what is your writing advice for this week? So it comes a little bit out of this interview of not Don't be frightened of challenging yourself. Just because you see yourself as one type of writer, don't be scared of trying something different, a different genre, a different form. And maybe that is the thing. Maybe if you're stuck, maybe if you're one of those writers who has worked on that first draft a hundred times and you're not getting anywhere and you don't know if you want to carry on, first of all, my advice is just throw that out and start something new but maybe start Mm. something completely different don't be afraid to challenge yourself I think that's my advice for the week what did you get out of Sapiwa's interview? I think what I got from Sapiwa was again on the subject of being unafraid to try something new he was talking about how there was a time in his life when he was working in government and he was working in academia and that the two felt toxic together Mm. and he ended up embracing the academic career while also maintaining his creative career and it's a big life change and I'm sure it's something that took a lot of courage to accomplish so I think what I got from him was if something is really not working in your creative life, don't be afraid to ditch something mm. and embrace something new. Mm. Mm. 
And really linked exactly with what I've just said. Very interesting. And Fiona, your writing advice this week. I would like to reiterate the power of 300 words, just 300 words a day. We've all got that in us. It doesn't feel like a huge hurdle that you have to accomplish every day. Mm. It's just a few paragraphs. And if you can find that 25 minutes to half an hour Mm. out of your day to write 300 words and you start today, in a year's time, you will have a thick, proper novel ready to go, ready to submit. Absolutely. I second that. It's, and it's inspiring, actually, um, thinking of it like that, thinking of how those little bits will add up together. Yeah, the little Lego bricks that are going to build you a big, big house. So if you as listeners have read anything by Sipiwo Mahala, if you have watched either of his stage plays, if you have an idea of how many words a day works for you, please get in touch with us. We're on all social media across the board and we would love to hear from you. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.